All right, so I have to get more in the habit of remembering to do this because I normally don't actually talk about titles, you know, with messages so much. And people ask me about them all the time. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you this one. The title of this one is What Are We Producing? What are we producing? Now, somebody said, oh, Jesus. Okay, yeah, wait. All right, yeah, it's, it's, it's an idea to look at ourselves individually and understand what our roles are. So one of the things that is important to realize is, is that we are not here by chance. Nobody is here by chance. I don't care what your story is. The Lord has ordained for you to be here at this moment, at this time, at this hour. It's not by a mistake. You could have been here at any time. You could have been alive 300 years ago, but you know what? You weren't. You were alive today. The Lord orders our steps. And if he orders our steps, he determined that you all would be here at this moment right now. Now, why is that? Well, that's the thing that we're trying to figure out. But I can tell you one thing, though. When we look out and we see what's happening in the world, and we see how crazy it is getting, and as time and time goes on, how it gets worse, we have to start to think to ourselves, like, well, what is the problem? And how do we play a part in that? Are we, as the body of Christ, operating as it should? Are we being as effective as, as we should? What exactly is our purpose? Let's talk about what some of that stuff is today, okay? Now, in basically the whole body of Christ conversation can be had in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All right, so I think it's maybe uh, verse 12 through 31. So from verse 12 all the way to the end, it gives a very big description of how the body of Christ works and what our role is and all of that. You all are familiar with that, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I do want to pick certain pieces of it out so I can make sure we all are on the same playing field before we go further, all right? Y'all with me? All right, so let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And let's talk about this for a quick second. It says that the body is a unit. Now, this is not talking anything super spiritual. This is talking about you, your body. Your body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all of its parts are many, they still form one body, all right? So when you look at yourself in the mirror, a lot of times we look at only certain things that make us distinguishable as ourself. Like, how do you know you are you when you look in the mirror? Do you really look at your ears and your eyes and your eyebrows and all of that? No, you see your body and realize what that looks like, right? But do you understand that there are many things that are involved in making you, you? When you think about all of your individual features, like I said, you got your eyes, you have your eyelids, which protect your eyes, you have your eyebrows, which are on top, you have your ears, which allow you to hear, you have your nose, which allows you to smell. You don't think about all of those things individually, you just say, oh, it's me. But all of those things do not cease to exist because we don't pay attention to them. They're all still there. So what this says is, is that so it is with Christ. Verse 13 says this. For we all were baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So what it's saying is, is that the same way that we have individual parts that make up who we are, so does the body of Christ. And this scripture says, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. So therefore, when we were baptized, when we accepted Christ, we now became an individual part of the body of Christ. Now, when we accepted Christ, that's when the, the, the change happened. Let's do verse 14 real fast. Now, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. All right. This is what I was saying a minute ago. When we look at ourselves, this is the example that we have. We aren't just a nose, and that's all we are. We aren't just an eyeball, but we are the sum of all of the parts put together. Each one of these individual parts is important. Here's a question. How many of you all freely don't mind giving away parts? 
How many of you all have parts that are not important to you? How many of you all say, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to leave the house today, but I'm going to leave my elbows in the house because I don't need them. <laughs> or I'm going to leave my thumbs today because, you know, I don't have any doors I need to open up, so I'm going to be okay. How many of us could operate effectively without thumbs if we had a choice? But everything is important, right? Or at least if God gave it to us, we want to keep it, right? Hmm. So if every part is important, and we all are part of the body of Christ, then every part of the body of Christ is important as well too, right? Okay. So we all have a role to play in the functioning of the body. So same thing that we're looking at right now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go to verse 17. Let's look at that. So if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Now, you can think about this in terms of Christ, or you can think it about it in terms of you. If your whole body were a giant eye, like I said, first off, how crazy would that look, right? <laughs> but what else would you be good for? You could see everything. everything. <laughs> but you couldn't hear anything. You couldn't smell anything. You couldn't eat because you had no mouth. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Verse 18 says, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every single one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So since we understand that this is an example, not to introduce us to our own body, but to introduce us to the body of Christ, then this part right here, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, has arranged the parts because we are all individual parts, right? We are all individual parts in the body of Christ. God has arranged them in the body, his body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be, which means that every, what's this word right here? Everyone. So we are a part of the body of Christ, and he has arranged everyone. So what does that mean? That every single one of you is a part of the body of Christ. And you are a rank, you're not just out here just just wandering around, you are a range where God wants you to be. Now, what am I saying from that? We each have a role in the body of Christ. There is nobody sitting in here. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you were sitting in here, you have a role in the body of Christ. We all are important. We all have a purpose. We all have a role. problem is that we have to work those purposes. Now, when you look out and you see things that are happening, and I say the world, but you know society, I mean, you don't need me to tell you. You see it all the time. You turn on the news, I'm sure it'll be something out there. Something happening, something crazy going on. This person said this, this person did that. But if God placed us here, if we're part of the body, and God allowed us to be here at this particular point in time, then apparently there's something that we should be doing about it. But we are a part of the body of Christ, and there's a problem because, well, there are actually two problems. It may be more than two, maybe more than four. But there are problems with the body of Christ today. I only wrote down two of them. That's all we had time for. Two problems with the body of Christ. The first one is, is that we aren't working together. Now, you are part of the body. Each one of you has a role and a specific purpose and a specific function, but you're not working with the other parts of the same body. Now, remember, what if your eyes in your individual bodies right now decide to stop telling your brain what they see? They can work and they can see all kind of stuff all day, but they stop telling the other parts of the body what it is. You have a dysfunctional body doing that, right? Or you outside on the street and you hear a car coming, but your ears didn't tell the rest of your body that something was on the way. Your body's not working together. I use this one in first service. How do we walk? We walk one foot at a time, right? One foot in front of the other, which means that as one goes forward, the other one has to stand back and wait, right? Then it goes its turn while the other one stands back and waits. What if they're not communicating that to each other and they both keep trying to walk at the same time? Question is, how far can we get doing that? 
But if we look in the body of Christ today, that's exactly what we got. We got two feet trying to move at the same time. We got the ears doing one thing, not telling the rest of the body what's happening. They're not working together. And then here's the second one. Not only are we not working together, we are not producing anything of substance. Producing. Producing. We're not making anything. So let's talk about the first one. Let's start there. We aren't working together. So let's talk about the power of working together. And this is what we're going to start with that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, it says this right here. Two are better than one. Working together. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Verse 10, if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Why, why is that? Because two are better than one. Okay, all right, verse 11. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Verse 12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Because two are better than one. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So we see that it's better when we have two. What is it that says in uh, verse 9? Go back to the very first verse. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their So they can get more done when you have two, right? More than what you can get done with one. We live in a world where a lot of times people don't, they don't like one another. So they don't want to work with one another. It's just easy to do it by yourself. But do you realize that you can't get nowhere near as much done working by yourself than you can working with somebody else, especially somebody else who has a purpose to be doing the same thing with you? How good is one foot just saying, okay, you know what? I don't need that other foot. I'm going to do this by myself. But both of you all are supposed to be walking the same direction. Use the other foot. You know, I was at a conference this, this past week, uh, Mel Leary and I and uh, to Stephanie in the back. And I heard this one thing, and I was like, man, that went perfect with what I was thinking. And this is what they said. And they talked about horses. And they said that the pulling power of a horse, a horse can, on average, pull about 8,000 pounds by himself. 8,000 pounds by himself, all right? That's just one. All right, so naturally, you would assume that, okay, well, Two horses can pull 16,000 pounds, right? You know, this one, eight, you know, this one horse pulling his eight, the other horse pulling his eight, they're doing their fair share, eight and eight is 16, so 16,000 pounds, right? No. Two horses, while one can do eight over here, the other over here, but if they are working together, they not only can pull 16,000 pounds, but they can actually pull tw uh, 24,000 pounds. So they can make up for an extra horse with the two of them are working together. Now, here's the crazy thing. They said, and I actually looked this up, so this is not just me trusting them, all right? So they said that if two horses come together, they can pull 24,000, right? You got me, right? Now, that's if these two horses just happen to be together, working together. But if you take two horses that grew up together, that train together, that every single time they were pulling, they pulled at the same time. They always working together. They did that from the time that they were young. They can pull more than 24,000. They can actually pull 32. And so, you know, to me, when I heard that, I was like, you know, that seems kind of consistent with the one can put 1,000 to fight. You know, two can put 10,000. Well, what about the other two? No, no, no. See, when you get other people together, the power is multiplied. And that's how it works. So one horse can do 8,000. Two horses, while they should be able to do 16, can actually do 24. And, uh, and if they've been together the entire time, them same two can pull four times the amount that one can do. But then we want to work by ourselves. This is scripture all the way in Genesis, Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 18. This is God talking about Adam. He said it is not good that man be alone. Now, a lot of times we take that and say, okay, well, that means that he just needed to create Eve, right? No, no, no. Not only did he need Eve, but he needed somebody. 
He said, let us create a helper suitable for him. But it's not good for him to be alone. There's another parable. It's called the, uh, the, the father, the son, and the bundle of sticks. And I'm going to tell you this one real quick. All right, so this is how this one works. All right, so father, the father was, he was dying. He was on his deathbed, all right? He had three sons. The sons never could get along at all. They were always fighting from the time they were young. They were always fighting. And the father on his, basically in his last words, he wanted to pull something together to allow them to realize they need to work it out. And so this is what he did. He gathered them all around the bed. There was three of them. And he gave them a bundle of sticks. He said, sons, all right, look, before I go, I just want you all to do this thing for me. I want you to break the sticks. He handed them to the first guy. First guy's trying. Every, single, you know, every kind of way he can think of, he's trying to bend them and all of that. They won't break. He got tired. He handed them to the second guy. Same thing, he's trying to bend them. But these sticks, it was a group of sticks, and they were tied together. So he couldn't break them. So then they gave it to the third one. Same thing. He tried it, he tried it, he tried it. Could not break the sticks. Father took the sticks back. Pull the string to loosen the sticks up. He said, you know what? Now try and do it. The second kid didn't even, or the second son, didn't even get the sticks because the first one broke them off. And he said, this is the power of what happens when you actually work together. Figure it out. Work your stuff out because as long as you all are arguing, you are separated. But when you can come together, nobody can defeat you. So, where am I going with all of that? There is power in working together. The body functions like it's supposed to when all of the parts work together. All of these individual parts in our own lives. What if one of them stops working like it's supposed to but causes problems someplace else? Anybody ever had a backache in here? Backache, right? You might have slept wrong or anything else like that. But you know, when, when you have a backache, when your back starts hurting, you have to compensate for it, right? And when you have to compensate for that, it puts strain on the other stuff that's supposed to hold, that's supposed to hold it straight. Because your other parts of your body weren't meant to support something your back was supposed to be doing. So there is power in working together. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16 says, From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. Remember I talked about us identifying ourselves in the mirror, right? How many of you all see your ligaments when you look in the mirror? No, it's just me, right? You're not thinking about all of this stuff going on inside. It's just you. But held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, in terms of your body, every ligament is important. We don't talk about it, but every single function is important. And the same thing is with the body of Christ. Each one of us has a role, and not only do we have a role, we have a job. It said it builds itself up in love as each part does its what? Work. Say that word again. Work. So the parts of the body that you have in your own body has a job, a function, right? So also in the same way, the body of Christ, every part has a what? Every part has a purpose. Every part has a job. Every part has something to do. Every part has a role. Yes. Amen. Now, to make it even plainer, if each one of us are part of the body, each one of us has a role. Every one of us, if you are in here, you have a job. You have a role. Now, not working on your job can be dangerous to the entire team. Here's, a, here's an example. Big movie coming out this week. Who knows what it is? Couple people, say, say it again, say it loud. Avengers. Avengers. You're like, he talking about the Avengers in church. You're right, because I, I am sure we're about to talk about the Avengers in church. All right? Now, how many of you all are familiar with the Avengers? And didn't none of y'all know the movie was coming out? Y'all ain't for real, right? Okay. All right, so how many of you all saw the first movie? The first Avengers movie, and I ain't talk, I'm talking about like, like they, what, like five years ago or something like that, right? Okay, because I don't know what they've been doing, you know, a long time ago. So in the very first movie, I'm going to tell you about a little bit of a scene, right? Because it, it popped out in my mind while I was doing that. And I was like, so the new Avengers movie's coming out, it's be perfect, right? Okay, so the Avengers, I'm going to talk about the ones who were in the first movie, because as time goes on, it's a bunch of them. 
All right, and y'all tell me if you don't know who the Avengers are, if you heard of these people. All right, first one, Captain America. Know who Captain America is, right? We know who Cap is, all right. Uh, Iron Man. Yeah. Yep, okay. Black Widow. Yeah. Yep. Black Widow, no, not a spider. I'm talking about the, uh, yeah, that's, that's her name. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah, oh, Scott, she said, she said her real name. Scott was in her hands, right. All right, Thor, the mighty Thor, right? We know who that is, right? Hawkeye, he was a guy that's like the, uh, yeah, he shoots the arrows, right, yeah. All right, and then lastly, the Hulk. Everybody knows who the Hulk is, right? Yeah. Right, okay, awesome. Now, there's a certain part in the first movie, if y'all haven't seen it, I'm finna tell you anyway, it's okay. All right, so there's a bad guy. I mean, this is not a spoiler. If you look at the, if you look at the cover of the movie, you can see these people in the movie. So um, the bad guy in the movie, or a bad guy in the movie, his name is Loki, all right? Yes, oh, somebody knows who Loki is, all right. Now, Loki and, uh, or Loki and Iron Man have a conversation. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of the conversation because it just jumped out of my mind, all right? Because I remembered this from when I saw the movie. Iron Man basically was having a conversation with Loki, and he said, we have all of these individual people who are part of this group of heroes, and you managed to take every single one of them off. And Loki said, you know, that was a part of my diabolical plan. And Iron Man's like, that's not a good plan. That's not a good plan at all. He said, because we all are coming for you. And Loki said, you know what? I got an army. And Iron Man said something back, which was so plain and so simple. He was like, an army? We got a hope. <laughs> Y'all remember that from the movie? To me, that was like a line. I just always remembered that. But you know what? In terms of working together, what if the hope decided not to show up that day? <laughs> and if you saw the movie, you know how crazy the hope was, how he was doing this thing. What if he decided not to come that day? Now, you talk about in terms of part of the body. He made up the part of this group called the Avengers. So if it was his job to wreak havoc and destruction and do all this other kind of stuff to the enemy, and he decides that, you know what, I just don't feel like it. Yeah. What would have happened? Now, to make this a real thing, I got, another, I got a friend of mine who was in the, in the military. He's back there. Uh, we talked about this this past week. And um, I sent him a text message. I said, man, listen, I want to know... In, in simplistic terms, because I don't want to make it e extremely, uh, you know, detailed and all that kind of stuff. But he's done a couple of tours in, in, in Afghanistan. He's in the military. And I said, look, I want to know what is part of your complement in terms of your team. When your team goes out, what kind of roles does the squad play? All right? And he started telling me all these things. I said, man, look, just as simple as it can get. You know, you, like, you'll have a guy that carries this, a guy that carries this. What do they carry and what's their function? All right? And he gave me a couple of them. I wrote down three of them. One of them would be the rifleman, all right? Now, another one would be the machine gunner. They carry around the big guns, all right? And then the third one would be a sniper. And I said, okay, cool. That's, that's what I want to work with. And we talked about the positions of each one of them. But I'm going to share with you right now, only going to share with you the role of what the sniper is. Because I felt like I could portray that quickly in a way we could all understand, all right? Now... The idea behind the sniper is, is that they can focus and see long range, all right? Now, their job is to see the stuff that the people in the front can't see on their team. Y'all understand that, right? Now, because the way a lot of times the enemy might do and because of the way the terrain might go is that if they wanted to set a bomb for them to run over, what they would do, the smart thing, is to get just out of range of where they can see. They plant the stuff, and then the people come run over it. They can't do it a long time, uh, you know, uh, days before, because somebody else could set it off, not who they want. So they have to do it slowly before they get there. So what they do is, is that they stay out of range of the other people, and then that way they can plant their stuff, or they could walk in in terms of an ambush. It's the sniper's job to see all of that. He can put a stop to that. He can let the team know, hey, guys, no, they're coming right now. They're coming this way. Stop looking the way you guys are looking. We're going to move this way because this is the way they're coming in. Or he can do something about it himself. Y'all understand that, right? So you understand how pivotal somebody who can see stuff that everybody else can't, what his role is. Well, what if he didn't sleep the night before and he, he feels like, he okay, I'm going to take a couple of, nap, you know, a couple, couple of minutes on a nap right now. Guys, y'all hold it down. 
nobody's up here but me. But I'm not feeling good, and I'm going to lay down and go to sleep. How much of a strain does that put on the rest of the team? Because now that's like giving everybody on the squad a backache, like what we just talked about. And so now they can't focus on their job of short and close and mid-range because they got to look further to even see if they're even facing the right direction. You know, and um, they used to do the same things when they would have lookouts, like in fortresses and, and, and towers and things like that. Somebody would have to stay at the top to look to make sure that nobody's coming that they don't know about. Also, when they would be steering the giant ships, you know, they had an area at the very top that somebody would stand at to see things that the captain of the ship could not see. Why? To make sure that they didn't hit something. The captain can see overall, but there's certain things that they may be running up on the captain can't see that is the job of somebody else to do. I'm not speaking too fast, am I? All right. So the idea is, is that what happens when your sniper, your watchman, the person who's supposed to look out for everything, just decides they don't want to do it anymore? Well, you still got a group of people. But what if you got a group of people who are not doing nothing? All right. All right. You know, we talk about a lot of times, oh, well, there's power in the group. There's power in a group of people doing stuff. Because if there was a power in a group, then the cemeteries would be the most powerful places on earth. Think about that. Where are you going to find more people together doing the same thing? But they did. But likewise, and this is unfortunate, we got many churches, assemblies, places, people in the body who have that same amount of power because they're not doing nothing. So let's look at this real fast. Ephesians 4, 16, and it says, and I said this one more time, as each part does its, what's this word? Work. Work. So if we are part of the body of Christ, we have work. Now, here's the hard question, or, you know, maybe the very specific one, is, is what type of work are we to do? What are we supposed to be doing? You keep talking about work. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing. Well, here's an idea. John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine. This is Christ talking. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. All right. So I went and found, you know, Christ is the vine. We are the fruit. So I went and found this picture right here. Because I wanted to try to, I know I like to break stuff down and figure it out, right? So, There are three things that we talked about here, right? We talked about the vine, we talked about the branches, and we talked about the fruit. This is how it works. Can y'all see my point here? This is the vine. See it? That is the vine. These are the branches. All right? And this is the fruit. Good job. Y'all catching on. Right. All right, so vine here, branches here, and fruit here. So look at this picture. I'm going to read it again. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I got a couple points on bearing fruit. Since we're talking about bearing fruit, let's discuss that real quick. The first point is, is that, number one, we should be producing fruit. You want to know what kind of work you should be doing? You should be producing fruit. If we are in him and he is in us, we will bear, how much did they say? Much fruit. So if God is in us and we are in him, we should be producing fruit. John chapter 15 verse 8 says that this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So we show ourselves as his disciples based on the fact that we are bearing fruit fruit. Now, so the first one, it was very simple. We should be producing fruit. The second one is, is to understand that bearing fruit is an act of submission. Oh, where you get that from? Well, uh, let's go back to our picture of the fruit, please. Bearing fruit is an act of submission, right? Okay, so 
Here's my pointer. Christ is the vine, right? We are the branches. The fruit comes from us, right? But the branches are connected to the vine. So where does the power come from? The power comes from the vine, right? When you hear it, it says fruit of the vine, not fruit of the branches. When was the last time you heard, I'm going to grab some fruit of the branches? Doesn't work that way. Because if this branch is broken off from the vine, what happens to the branch? It dies. And what about any fruit that was on the branch when it was disconnected? It dies as well, too. Huh. So the power flows through the branches, but not from them. See, so what if this branch got all uppity and said, you know what? This fruit is mine. The power can't come from the branch. The power comes from the fruit, I mean, from the vine. John chapter 15, verse 4 says this. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, let's talk about this real quick. And you all will remember this one as well, too. This is about the tree that had no fruit. Matthew chapter 21, verse 18. Early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. We're talking about Jesus, right? Jesus, he was hungry. As he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Next verse. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. Okay, stop right there. Because what happens right after this is the disciples say, well, wait a minute, how can you just talk to the tree and just wither or whatever? And Jesus is like, oh, well, you know, the words that you speak, they're powerful and can do all of this. But the disciples miss what literally just happened. they watching the fact that the tree withered, but not why he did it. So let me ask you all this question. Why was the tree cursed? It wasn't bearing fruit, right? Say Jesus was hungry. He went looking for fruit, didn't find any fruit, right? But what it said, though, seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. What's wrong with leaves? All right, I got a picture. All right, let's put the other picture up. What's wrong with this? That's beautiful, isn't it? You know what? People can look at that, especially people who know God, right? And be like, man, this is the kind of stuff that can tell of the greatness of God. You see the colors in the air. You see the things that are happening. You realize that the leaves are bringing life for everything else, right? But it was still cursed, though, right? Leaves are beautiful. They decorate the trees. But Jesus was hungry. And you don't eat leaves. And I found out why you don't eat leaves. I looked it up before anybody is going to ask me if I ate them. No, I, I, they, I looked it up. They contain this thing called tannin, all right? And the thing in tannin causes the leaf itself to taste bitter. You ever had something bitter? Well, imagine trying to eat a bunch of it. Every one of them is like that. They also lack de- decent levels of nutrition for us. Now, other animals can get them, but we can't find the nutrition that we really need from leaves. And then lastly, they're difficult for us to digest. And you know, other animals can do it. You know, they talk about cows. We have all these different chambers and stomach and all this other kind of stuff, right? We don't have that. So it's more difficult for us to digest leaves. So here's the thing. The Lord went looking for fruit from the tree, but he didn't find any. All he found were leaves. Now, here's a hard question. The tree was not producing fruit, right? But the tree had produced leaves. So was the tree actually fulfilling a purpose? You think about it, right? The tree just didn't have any fruit, but it was producing all of these leaves. But that's not what God was looking for. So I thought about this right here. There are many people in the body of Christ who think they might be producing fruit, but they're producing leaves. So watch this. Look at ourselves. Are we fruit producers or leaf producers? And I'm going to tell you all the difference between them. And I'm going to ask the question again. Are we producers of fruit or are we producers of leaves? 
Now, we in an age right now where we got a ton of leaf producers. It's a bunch of them. You don't even have to look hard for them because I'm going to tell you how you can find them. Leaf producers are the ones who can say good things and look good when they do things, but they offer no substance in what they have. They can talk a good game, but they have nothing of value. They make you feel good at the moment, but as soon as you leave from out of their presence, you feel just as bad if not worse than you did before. That's a leaf producer. Yep. That's not to say the thing is not on his job. Right. But what is it producing? Right. Second one, leaf producers only want to work when somebody can see them. They only want to do things when they can get recognition for it. Yeah. They don't respond to a need, they respond to an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Hey, brother, sister, so-and-so, you coming to serve today? I don't know who all over there. It's raining today. Are we fruit producers or are we leaf producers? Leaf producers want to be over everything, but they can't work with nobody else. That's the next one, Brother Charles. Uh, listen, yeah, the leaf producers want to be over everything, but they can't work with others. They don't know how to be team players. They think the strength isn't having a whole bunch of people up under you, but don't know, none of them know how to work together. <laughs> and then finally, leaf producers are unable to help those who are truly hungry for Christ. If our purpose is to produce fruit, but all we are producing is leaves, see, when people actually get hungry for God, They need that. They need him. And it is our job to provide that. But when we have something that offers no substance, then we wonder why the world is crazy as what it is because we're not giving them anything. They can't eat leaves. It makes it bitter in their mouth. 1 John chapter 3 and 18 says this. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth if we are part of the body then we each have a job to do and that job to do in whatever role that God has positioned us is to bear fruit how much fruit are we bearing we got to produce something James chapter 1 verse 22 says do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says Do what it says. Don't just listen to it. Don't just listen to it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, this reminds me of another one. I tell you, you know what? Actually, I have it in here. I was about to skip to it. I'm not going to skip to it. I'm, we almost there. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works before others, right? They may see your good works. So the works that you produce is for somebody else to see that they can glorify the Father in heaven. You understand that, right? Yeah. This is why each one of our roles are important. Amen. The body of Christ is walking around with two toes and like five, seven fingers because we don't have two hands or eyes that are not working right because each part is not doing its work. People need to see your works. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit fruit in every good way. So you bear fruit through the work. Bearing fruit in every good work. Think about that. Bearing fruit in every good work. And this last one right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20. 
Now, this may seem like un unrelated, but it's definitely not. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Stop right there. We use this one occasionally, and it's extremely important now because the same thing that I said just a minute ago reigns true right here. We are the ones that represent the body of Christ to others who don't know him. It is our job to make sure that others can see the glory of God through us so that they can accept him. When we see what's happening in the world, what kind of ambassadors does God have? Are the ambassadors that are speaking the most and saying the most things and doing the craziest stuff, are they leaf producers or are they fruit producers? But you know what? Every single one of us in this room has to make the choice on what we do. I'm not talking about any particular person. I'm talking about all of us. Each one of you can have a choice to be a leaf producer or a fruit producer. Bearing fruit in every good work. But you can't just go there because we got to understand that we have a role. We are all part of the body of Christ. And not one particular part at all is unimportant. Everything is important. Each one of you are important. Each one of you, not only are you important, you have a job specifically for you. And it's by working that job, that's how you bear the fruit. But when you're not working that job, that's when you bear the leaves. And it may come a time when somebody's hungry to grab some of the fruit from there. They need it, and you have nothing else to offer for them. We have to take the time to examine our fruit. Is it good fruit? Is it bad fruit? Is it no fruit? And what type of response we're going to get from God when he comes looking for the fruit and all we have to offer are leaves. God, I did the best I could. That fig tree in the story didn't have time to say a word. That fig tree didn't have time to explain itself. Let's go back to that picture of the, of the, uh, the vine one more time. Because here's, the, here's the, the easy thing about it, all right? All right, Christ is a vine, right? We are the branches, and we bear the fruit. That sounds extremely hard, and it sounds extremely uneasy. It sounds difficult, right? Man, you don't know what you're asking me to do. It's hard out here in these streets. It's rough. Can't work like this. But the power doesn't come from the branches. The power flows from the vine through the branches. So if the branches can't create fruit on their own, but can only do it through the Lord or through the vine, then all the branches have to do is to stand back and just be used. As long as the branches don't get uppity and say, you know what, I don't need this vine. Detach themselves from the vine and try to do it themselves. But understanding that every branch is a part of the tree, every part of the body is part of the body of Christ. Each one of us is part of the body of Christ. He gives us the power that we need. So all we have to do is allow everything that comes from here to just flow through us to the fruit for a dying world who does not know Christ. Amen, that's it.